Spud, the spontaneous pop-up display. I like the name. Do you remember the first time you streamed the video on your smartphone? At that moment, you were no longer tied to your living room for your entertainment or to your office for work. You could access your content anywhere. But there's one small problem, your small mobile device screen. Almost all of us prefer large displays for entertainment and for work. When those work deadlines are approaching, a large desktop monitor or a dual screen setup will significantly boost your productivity. So what if there is a way to have the mobility of a phone, tablet, or laptop without losing the benefit of a large screen? Sounds with this music, but that's exactly what we did. What? Introducing Spud, the spontaneous pop-up display. <laughs> Spud is a high-resolution, 24-inch display that right. collapses down to the size of a book and weighs less than two pounds. This mm. revolutionary product... Yeah, so it kind of rolls up like a like an arm pressure testing kit almost, right? and then it pops up into a projector. It's kind of neat, and it hooks up over uh, different, uh, like a USB-C or whatever kind of adapter you got. Now, it's, it's called Spud, which is a completely new type of product, they say. It's the world's largest and por- port- most portable display because it's essentially using projection inside that little housing. Mm-hmm. You see right there, you just hooked up USB-C to... To send the signal. Well, the overall, course. it's 24 inches. Can use it, uh, HDMI as well. That is a good question. Uh, the resolution is. I'm not sure. <laughs> Actually, I don't see it on here. I'm sure it's on here. I just didn't look at it. But yeah, isn't that funny? Hmm. Let's find the resolution, Wes. I like that. Look at that. That's pretty cool. That is actually pretty cool. I wonder how bright it is too. Uh, that would be the other question I have. You know, I played with that once when I was uh, when I was younger. Back when I saw it a CRT TV, I had like a flat lens hooked up on mm-hmm. front to try to project it. Oh yeah, did not work very well. So I mean, this seems like something you'd have to kind of, you know, I'd want to see the quality of the display to yeah. really know like how I many love... uses you could do. But it's a really cool idea. I love that. Okay, so USB, HDMI, brightness dial, mm. and the spud ba- spud on button. <laughs> Everybody get your spud All right, here on. we go. Here we go. Here's the nitty ditties. Uh, here yes. we go. Here we go. You ready for the itty bitties? Uh, 720p. 720p is okay. your. It's so it's 720p. Mm-hmm. The battery runs for four hours at uh, 70 uh, 785 nits, which is pretty pretty good really for. Or you can get 10 hours at 350 nits, and it's less than two pounds. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 16 by 9 aspect ratio runs off a of 12 volt DC power, or you can hook it up to a USB uh, plug and run it off of that. It's got built in speakers too. <laughs> that's kind of neat and it's got this case I mean you know as far as uh, as far as something for you know for not in a crazy amount of price that you could mm-hmm. uh, throw in your backpack if you travel a lot picture it Wes with convergence oh this is Linux Unplugged episode 170 for November 8th 2016 Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show. Let's try not to think about the election doomsday. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello, Wes. Hello, Chris. We're going to have a nice tight show today because it is actually election day. And that's, everybody's like, actually in the chat room today, they're like, just don't do Unplugged and just do like an unfiltered, unplugged combo Giant show thing, yeah, and talk right? about the election. I'm like, that's not Linux related. You don't understand how this works. We need our daily <laughs> dose, weekly dose of Linux. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. We need our unplugged dose. So mm-hmm. we do have a good show coming up. We've got a birthday to celebrate, but we've also got some great hardware to talk about. And then later on in the show, we're going to be helpful. Even if you're a pro user, we got a couple of helpful uh, updates for you this week. But if you're getting into Linux, or you're going to help somebody get into Linux, we got some great newbie stuff coming up, some great tips, including embracing the command line. I said it. I said it. Don't be scared. Don't run away. We're going to embrace the command line. Also, if you're using FileZilla, knock it off. Stop it. We got something you should know about. And a replacement product. A project? Not product. Something like that. It's been forked. It's been forked. Somebody got hacked. And it it motivated them to fork FileZilla. Ooh. Yeah. We'll tell you about that. But, Wes, before we get into any of the stuff, the updates, the segments we got coming up, you know what we got to do? Oh, there's something very important. We got to bring in that virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hello. 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 Hello.
Hey, hello, hello. Man, I would thought you guys should all, aren't you all supposed to be out voting right now? These must be people from outside the states, mm-hmm. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I can't vote for a particular awake, thing there. So. Everybody's yeah, got oh, for me to look, vote. Listen to all these it. excuses, all right? these excuses. I voted nah, man, I am voting. Give me like five hours. <laughs> got a plan. Hello, everybody. Hey, already voted. Good for you, good for you. All right, well, uh, Let's uh, let's celebrate uh, a, a very important birthday that almost just passed us right by. I know, right? But we did manage to catch it, and it's something that we we all can relate to. It's at a milestone, the twenty fifth birthday, where Vim's car insurance finally goes down in price. Happy happy birthday to Vim! This is a rowdy crowd. <laughs> Come on, guys, you're in my house. Oh, hold on. That's right. I, uh, no, 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 over 25 no, years no, no, ago, no, 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 over 25 years ago, it was started. You see, the problem was is that Bram he wanted something like Vim for his Amiga. He was a big user of uh, VI. I'm sorry, I should say VI. He wanted something like VI, but they didn't have anything like that on the Amiga. So in 1991, on November 2nd, he released the first version of VI, Imitation Edition. After three years of working on it, the VI Imitation Edition. Two years later. With the version 2.0, so he first version took three years, second version took two years. Two years later, with version 2.0 of Vim, the feature set had exceeded that of the original VI. Or VI. Uh, and so they changed the acronym, acronym from Vim Imitation to Vim Improved. Isn't that great? That is really cool. That is really cool. That, that is, uh, that is, you know, that is a big milestone. Twenty fifth birthday, an indispensable tool. I mean, and think about where it's gone and how widely it's deployed today. Thank God we have Nano. I mean, what? No, I, oh, I come on. And they still don't know how semantic versioning works. <laughs> I, 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 I used <laughs> Nano once in a video recently, and I've been getting crap about it for two weeks. Chris, you use Nano? You just gotta say it's for the new Linux users. You know, you're trying to be friendly. What are you doing? What are you doing? That's what they. I thought you would use VI or Emacs. Why are you using Nano? <laughs> because I just, I just. I think it's nice. What are you doing, man? Nano dash W. Nano nano dash Nano tac W. Forever. That's See, I don't I, even know what tac W I, does. <laughs> Enlighten us. Oh man, it's just my. It's it just supports uh, wide okay, uh, wide characters it. without cutting it off. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> when you got config files, guy. That's all it does. Uh, but you know, I just I I actually. If I'm editing the file, I don't know what this is. Mm-hmm. If I'm editing the file, I tend to use Vim because I got like my colors and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But if I'm viewing a file and I don't want to use cat or more or whatever, like if I don't want to just like look at the file, I just want to just like for some reason open it up but not edit it. Like when I'm going to look at a file and I'm going to dig around but I'm not going to use sudo, I use nano for some reason. Mm. And then when I'm going to edit the file with root privileges, I pseudo vi then the file. Okay, isn't that weird? That is weird. But I mean, I can see you know if it's just something you've learned in your fingers now and you just type it right. So it's like the one is my viewing editor mm-hmm. and one is my editing. Not sure editor. viewing edi- editor I know, is it's a so consistent stupid. idea. It's but... so dumb because I do every now and then when I'm already in there. Now I'm like, well, I'll just change that real quick. Right, right, and then yeah. <laughs> and then it's like I go to I go to save and it's like and you, you don't have that you don't have the privilege because you didn't sudo of using sudo t to get out of it. Right? <laughs> yep, it's so suck. It's so stupid. But it's habit. It's habit from from a decade ago when I was revolting and wanted I wanted to find a new text editor and I had this I had this. Uh, Boss, who was the only other Unix slash Linux oh, guy in the office mm-hmm. with me, and we would prank each other constantly. Um, and so I remember, like, the, I had replaced Vim, like, when he would use when he would use VI, it would echo like Bruce stinks or something like that on there. Bruce is a monkey nice. on the, or and we did things like we'd set up cron jobs to send system wide messages uh, on the hour, so every mm-hmm. user logged into the system would see Bruce smells like a monkey and things like that. Like we'd mess around with each other, and I remember Nano was sort of the prank we would use. Like to, we'd set up an alias just so things would lo- run, launch in Nano or whatever. Like there was all these, so I think that's where it started, and then it just sort of became because I got pranked. I think I just stuck yeah. with it. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, well, I'm not gonna let this screw this. I'm not, I'm not gonna let this defeat me. I will me. use this editor. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, it is a fun editor. <laughs> and then now here I am, years later, and I'm getting crap from the internet. <laughs> it's like, okay, but you guys what don't understand. How a lot of stories end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I put it up on Facebook and got fired. Uh, all right, well, let's talk a little hardware. I'm always out there looking for like the next perfect set top box. And I truly believe something that's like the NVIDIA Shield but fully ran Linux 
uh, GNU slash not, Linux. Not Android, not NVIDIA's right. fork of Android Linux. Yeah. And you know, if NVIDIA is forking Android, they're not forking it too hard because they're managing to, li- to deliver the monthly Android update still. Yeah, I didn't. I don't. I don't mean a hard fork. I mean, I don't know yeah. if they are or not, but it does seem like it has its own like you know launcher and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I've been watching um, this space kind of with some curiosity, and 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 the beard found this article because he knew it was right up my alley. Zotac is cramming an AMD Radeon RX 480 into a PC that is the size of well, it's smaller than a NUC. Wow. Yeah, so hey, that looks pretty slick. Yeah, it's the Magnus ERX 480, and it comes uh, with the AMD Radeon RX 480 Polaris based GPU. And this is pretty nice because they're gonna have three versions: <clears throat> bare bones, which is bare bones, plus, which is the version you get if you're buying it for Linux, oh. and then they sell a Windows 10 edition, which is the version that you buy if you accept defeat in your life and are a masochist and you like to label yourself. As pushing the easy button, you you I mean, buy that, or you really need Cortana just <laughs> everywhere in your life. Yeah. <laughs> that seems like it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the bare bones version is what you'd expect, like just a little kit with a 2.2 gigahertz Skylake CPU. Somehow, somehow, KB like didn't make it in there. They must have been working with Apple. <clears throat> but the one you probably care about, the Plus version, uh, you can get uh, you can get it pretty tricked out. In fact, you can get up to 32 gigs of RAM in the sucker if you want to. Uh, but it comes stock with eight gigs of RAM, a one terabyte, two point five uh, inch hard drive, and a hundred and twenty gigabit M dot gigabyte. Sorry, M dot two SSD. Hmm. So that's not bad, really. And it's it's I it's smaller than a NUC, which really is impressive. Which could make this a really nice little Steam OS slash Cody box. Possibly. And you're not doing anything anything weird with a NUC with you know like trying to rig in an external GPU. It's mm-hmm. like it's just it's there. Exactly. Box. Yeah, the external, come on. Yeah. Come right. on, right? I mean, geez, come on. It's kind of got a lot of uh, ports on the back, too, like a lot of I.O. Like, check this thing out. I'll zoom in a little bit if you're watching the video version here. We got ourselves uh, two Display Ports, two HDMI, two Ethernet. Two? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, uh, it's got a Wi-Fi. Well, it has a, yeah, that, this port right here is for an external Wi-Fi antenna. And then over here, this is an external power supply port. And it looks like we've got four USB ports, and two of them are USB three. This is some serious. That's awesome. Yeah, and the front's got some I/O on it too. So dual Ethernet, dual I HDMI, know, the dual, dual Ethernet. That's great on this form factor. Of course, dual Display Port. I mean, if you mm-hmm. got a, if you got a Polaris uh, GPU in there, you can you can uh, you can afford to run monitors, and these ports are small enough. Mm-hmm. That's that's oh, pretty man. neat. So if you're looking at tiny PCs, that Zotac one might be pretty cool. And we'll have a link to the PC World article where they talk about it, and it was called. Uh, Oh, they had a, oh yeah, the Magnus. The Magnus. Mag, the Magnus. Uh, speaking of cool hardware, Ben is joining us in the mumble room. He just got himself a new System 76. Did you get the Lemur, Ben, or what did you get? I got the Lemur. The oh, Lemur. I'm not familiar with that one. The Lemur. Hmm. Yeah. So what, tell me, uh, what did you get? What was your spec? Did you get the base unit? Did you modify it all? How long have you had it? I put some upgrades in it. Well, come on, you got to get yeah, the deeds. Tell us the deeds. All right, all right. Here's the order page. I paid... <laughs> Let me tell you what I paid for. I paid a thousand three hundred thirty-four dollars for it, okay. and I got second-day air shipping. Ooh, yes, at sixteen oh four dot one on it mm. with a one fourteen mat display IPS LED. Back yeah, the mat display. So instead of the shiny right. display, right? Right, an HD graphics six twenty, mm. <clears throat> and I also got the two point seven up to three point five. Processor i7 when all nine yards. Yes. Are you worried at all about heat on the, when you go up to the i7? What do you think? Mm, it's only two cores and four threads, so it's nothing major. Yeah. I also mm. got 16 gigs of RAM, a 2400 megahertz DDR4, mm-hmm. and a 250 gig M.2 SSD. Nice. As, Good call. And I also got a secondary 500 gig drive, as well as a the upgraded Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and yeah. It's nice so to be able to get a, a laptop that small and still have an Ethernet port on yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. No joke, because uh, in honesty, I sold my MacBook for this thing, because I just was getting so fed up with this stupid thing. It was like, I can't run Linux very well on this mm-hmm. darn thing. Mm-hmm. That's how we started chatting about this, yeah. really. Is, right, yeah. and truthfully, I... Uh, I just was got so fed up the thing. I sold it on eBay and bought this System 76 because I just wanted to be able to run my Linux just fine. And I finally just said, "Screw it!" And you know, so how's you know, the I keyboard been and yeah. uh, the screen quality and all that? 
it's been fine. It's, you know, been very wonderful. It's better to type on than any of my other laptops I own, and huh. I'm very pleased. That's good. And the screen, That's- how's the screen? The screen looks good? Great. Not had any problems. <sighs> These guys are all making me want to get a new rig mm-hmm. so bad. See, yeah. I- <laughs> I've got the Apollo, yeah. which is really great, but it's only two core, and I um, want I, I want a four core system for video editing. Yeah. So yeah, your mobile editing rig, you yeah. Know, yeah. So like yeah. my Apollo has become my my go to at home computer, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. that's wonderful. But when I want to edit video, I'm like eh, I'm kind of still going towards the MacBook Pro, mm-hmm. just because <laughs> it's got four cores and a dedicated right. and a dedicated card. GPU. Yeah. And I'm loving this thing so much, Chris. I might actually throw Arch on it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should. Just because I'm that daring. <laughs> I think it would probably run fine, really. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Especially with those total of six cores, I'm I'm going to have so much fun doing that. And I might actually stream the install. You know, one thing Mike was saying on Coda Radio is he's not a big fan of the trackpad. What are your thoughts on the trackpad? Because you were using a MacBook mm-hmm. Pro before, and they they tend to have pretty good mm-hmm. trackpads. Well... I actually think it's better than the MacBook trackpad. Really? How so? Well, I'm going to be honest. I liked the Mac trackpad, but it's just that tap to click was horrible. And I'm actually finding that um, it's Having physical buttons is nice. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually, the HP I'm talking to you guys on right now has buttons on it, as does my System76. So I'm finding that a heck of a lot easier. And I've actually... When I'm playing like SWOTOR or something, I'm having a heck of a lot better time gaming and uh, made of Linux Steam games, which I do do. I've had a lot better time like playing, uh, you know, KOTOR 2 on Linux, which has natively ported very much better. Hmm. Well, keep us updated, Ben, on how it goes, because um, <clears throat> I think Will a lot do. of people are looking right now. Mm-hmm. And no so problem. This is, this in, I've been following this topic with a lot more interest yeah. recently. Yeah, the more first-person yeah. feedback we can get, the better. Yeah. And also, I will send you a picture of my uh, soon-to-be uh, setup as well. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love setup oh. pictures. Um, I, I got, I got, a, we got to move to something that's a little disappointing yeah. because it makes me, it makes me remember the time where I had such a badass PVR setup, and I would have been crushed if I would have seen this news back then. But the official Myth Ubuntu distro is is going away. Uh, the developers of Mythbuntu Linux distribution have announced that the development of the official Ubuntu flavor will come to an end in the coming future. They stated that it's just because of a lack of manpower to work on updates and bug fixing. Of course, you can still, you know, just install Zubuntu or Ubuntu and install Myth, Myth, but this is sort of, I think, more indicative of a bigger, like, trend happening, where this is is probably PVRs on Linux, probably just going to get rolled into something like Kodi, and I got to imagine there's a couple of projects. Well, MB and Plex are both also able mm-hmm. to do this stuff now. Mm-hmm. Don't you think things like Myth TV might be a little bit of an older style and model? And, you know, I know, especially it was great, like, early 2000s when you, you know, you had all the cable channels, you wanted a digital access to them, things like Netflix, et cetera, weren't necessarily big or streaming yet, so it made it a lot of sense, and maybe it, you know, it still has a place, but it's not, not nearly as popular. Mm-hmm. But man, I had such a cool setup for one for a and little it's, while. It's still awesome software. Had it remove all the commercials and save yeah, them right? off to a special folder, and it was just and I could access it on all my TVs. It was Especially it was so cool. To something where like you're using the proprietary thing, or you're, yeah. you, what you've got a VCR and you're programming <laughs> in the time in, looking up the th- it, no. It is so that's so not how right. I want to do it. Uh, yeah. So if you if you're a Myth Ubuntu user, don't fret. You can the Myth TV isn't going away. Just that particular distribution. Uh, but I, you know, I, I back then was relying on these put together distros because I just didn't want to invest the time in figuring out everything. Um, I actually eventually even built them on top of Gen two boxes, so I did eventually just roll my own. But getting started, it was really nice to have a distro. I can't remember which one it was called to be honest with you, but it was Fedora based at the time. You know, I think I'd like to hear um, Chris Lass. The Gen two years on uh, user error. Sometimes. <laughs> that would be good. I, I, you know, people people think we're crazy for running Arch mm-hmm. in the places we roll Arch. I ran Gen two Linux in the most mission critical of mi- fi- financial institutions where the ability to process and prove transactions was running on these boxes, and I put them on Gen two. So that would be a good story because yeah, right? it was looking back on it is as much of a fan of rolling Linux as I am right now. Never would have done that. 
<laughs> never. But something, I guess, I don't know if I was stupid at the time. I, I do know part of it was there was, I was excited, mm-hmm. and there was only so many ways to get this version of Cups with these drivers sure. and this and version of Samba. Place if that's yeah, what you need, yeah right? that, that, was, that was sort of it, but... Yeah, you know what? Maybe if you'd like to hear that story, come see me in California. I'll be in the Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley area this weekend, uh, Sunday, November 13th. We're going to do a meetup where I'd normally be doing Linux Action Show since we pre-recorded last weekend. I'm going to do a meetup in uh, California. So if you're in the area, go to Jupiter, or I'm sorry, go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting, or just find a link in the show notes and let me know if you're going. Right now, the plan is to go to the Shandong Restaurant which is famous for their dumplings Ooh. and all their other delicious food. And uh, we'll just hang out and chat. Watch Chris eat dumplings, you know, buy him a beer. <sighs> or maybe I'll buy you or a beer, maybe depending. You'll, yeah, you right. never know. You just never know. Meetup, meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. That sounds like a ton of fun. It might be. It might be. Uh, yeah, and then we're going to stay down in the California area through Monday. And, but that'll probably just mostly be doing the tourist thing and yeah. recording some videos. A little pick, vacay. Picking up what we call in the industry some B-roll mm. uh, for the for the footage, mm-hmm. you know, so that way when we come back and put it all together, I got shots of California. The establi- California experience. Location establishing shots with air quotes. That you didn't just you mm-hmm. know, make it all up. Yeah. I didn't just go to video blocks and buy it off of mm-hmm. B-roll. Yeah. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting if you'd like to hang out. And while I'm on my way down to California and I'm sitting there working in Lady Jupes, I'll be connected to a Ting freaking MiFi. That's right. That's right. Go to linux.ting.com to sign up and support the show and get $25 off your first Ting device or $25 in service credit. If you have a GSM or CDMA device, check their BYOD page because they support both types of networks. And now newer phones, they just have like the universal GSM chips and they work everywhere. It's amazing. So nice. It's the way it should have been mm-hmm. all along. Right. And that's that's Ting. Ting is the way wireless should have always been because you just pay for what you use. No contract, no determination fee, no locked phones, no like Ting experience layer where they get in the way of you and updates and they hold back update. None of that. None of it. Let's just stop. It's almost 2017. Let's stop. And you can do your part. Go to linux.ting.com and just take the Ting litmus test. Click that what would you save button. When you're listening to this, we have a new president of the United States. And God knows now that that person's in office, you're going to need to save money. <laughs> that is, works either way, Wes. How timely, Chris. How timely. <laughs> linux.ting.com. Go there and uh, check them out. they got great customer service. They have a bunch of good devices from the budget category and probably, honestly, ones you haven't even considered because Ting's thinking outside the box with some of these things. Everything from feature phones like the Moto G4 Play is also a great uh, smartphone with a decent feature set for a great price. MiFi's, Blue devices, Nexus devices, internet phones, and they got a great blog to top it all off. Did you see this, Wes? They did a how-to on how to install a freaking USB power outlet in your home. So you take, like, the power really? plug. Yeah, no more adapters and dongles. No, no. Just go right from the wall to your device. That's great. That's kind of a neat tip. they yeah. got a bunch of great tips over there. That's just an example. They're such nerds. <laughs> I love it. La- nope. Linux.ting.com. Go there. Because Linux. you got to put that mm-hmm. in. And, you know, in case, like, you got a significant other that sits down in your at your computer and you're a little worried about what might come up in your URL history, Good to have Linux in there because then it just looks like you're geeking out all the time. So it's also just good for you. It's good for us. It's good for mm-hmm. Ting. Let's just everybody do each other a favor right now. You're watching live. You're sitting home listening. You're in your car doing 70, mi- 70 miles per hour down the freeway. I want you to grab your iPhone. No, 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 no. Don't do it then. But I want you to grab your phone. Every other time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Linux.ting.com. Go there. Check them out. Grab a device or bring a device. Save some money and only pay for what you use. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Unplugged program, Linux.ting. Dot com. Well, we got a little uh, breaking news right now as we record the show, Wes. This is breaking news. Yeah, we got ourselves a brand new edition of Cinnamon that just hit, uh, well, stable, but it's not actually available to install. Version 3.2 has been released by Clem, and it's got some fanciness in it. It comes with a workspace switcher that's been nice and updated and improved, simplified background manager, keyboard navigation for context menus, which... Is That's dope. Nice, yep. Yeah. Updated app indicators and settings, support for display and percentage next to the volume slider. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, I think there's a couple other nice ones in here, like the placement of the system tray notifications was fixed and is no longer dependent on GCOMP, which could be good depending on your view. And last but not least, I think probably this is the most expose Mac like feature, but mm. also kind of useful. They call it Peak. At the desktop. Oh, that's cute. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's, as you can kind of guess by the name, it's a desktop applet that lets you whoop, quickly take a peek at your active desktop and 
throws everything out of the way. Also, support for the latest GTK 3, I believe, is in there. Cinnamon 3.2, probably going to be hitting, you know, a point update in Mint soon, Arch repos, and other places where you get your cinnamon. That's not a bad update from no, the Cinnamon No, no, no. Team. You know, I'm, I, I'm not using it a lot these days, but I still I still have good, a great respect for Cinnamon just as a very usable, you know, it's not necessarily the prettiest or the newest looking, but I feel it's, it's still like pretty, a very, I think it's, it's, if you're like a... You're right, though. It's if you're not going traditional. To, right. If you're not going to go full, like, uh, tiling window manager, <clears throat> I find it a good power user desktop. Hmm. Hmm. Still think Gnome 3 edges out a bit for me, but I agree. It's it's in there. So I asked Wes, I said, Wes, what's one of your favorite stories this week? And uh, you found this uh, freeing my tablet, a.k.a. Android hacking, both the software and the hardware. And this guy writes, two years ago, I left my country. This is sad, It's a sad story, but uh, that was this is uh, just to say I had some time and I was working remotely for an Irish startup. And uh, he wanted to get Debian on his tablet. That is and an ambitious goal. There was no real open source process for rooting the device, getting Debian on there. So he starts up with an Asus MemoPad 10, specifically the ME103K edition, uh, which came out in like August, I think, of 2015. It's got a 10-inch screen, a gigabyte of RAM, quad-core Qualcomm Snapdragon, and 16 gigs of storage. Jesus, sounds like it's about like about like a MacBook Pro. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, <laughs> but this this is where it really kind of gets interesting, though, because he had to do like this whole deep dive into Android and figure out like how the Android boot process works and all of the secrets. What was it? What was it that grabbed your attention? Yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, it kind of just reads as almost um, like a Rosetta Stone for you know like traditional GNU slash Linux desktop users, because like we're we're used to our user land, and Android has the kernel, but it's it's such a different system from everywhere up. And so, like, he really kind of talks a lot about, like, how Android is structured so that he, you know, so that you can replace it with Linux. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is a really cool, like, uh, journey that he documents here. Like, just the time it must have taken to stop at every stage and document this and capture it and then save it for his blog later. Exactly. And that's a lot of work. And, he, you know, and he's, and he's, he's looking at waveforms. He's, it, it's really a deep dive, and it's a lot of fun. Sometimes I picture like the guys at Canonical that were trying to figure out how to get Ubuntu Android Edition working for the first time, right, doing stuff like quite this. Quite like this. Yeah, <laughs> they're digging around in there. Uh, that's interesting. It's probably the most important, and the probably most impressive part about it is the documentation aspect. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, because it's so well. Like the code aspect is clearly indicated on here. Like it's he's using some nice formatting. SE Linux. Oh, and he talks about having to work around SE Linux. So hopefully this will be more useful too. You know, as, as we see more, you know, Ubuntu on phones roll out, uh, as we see more stuff where like more Android stuff becomes, you know, in the mainline kernel. Hmm. Hopefully this will be more useful. I know, yeah. like you know, Nexus Five is mostly supported in mainline now. Yeah. So maybe maybe I can hmm. run Debian on here. Hmm. Not that I would. So remember, I was talking about FileZilla, and uh, I like it. I've been, I've used FileZilla for years. It's not it's not gorgeous or anything, but it sure gets the job done. And uh, it, according to this person. FileZilla does not encrypt your saved FTP passwords, and because of it, he was hacked, and so he ended up forking FileZilla and wow. calls it FileZilla Secure. FileZilla Secure is a free FTP client that has all the features of the original FileZilla, plus it encrypts your FTP passwords to protect from hackers stealing them. <laughs> but they're local passwords, so it doesn't really matter. It's the same argument with Pigeon from back in the day. Yeah, I guess... I guess somebody either got on his machine. Oh, mm-hmm. malware got into my system through a browser exploit, and within seconds, someone was suddenly had access to all of my websites. So, do you know? Does it then like prompt you to enter like an unlock key? How does it? Uh, it looks like it from the screenshots. Obscure, yeah, though. there's a master password to decrypt your FTP okay. logins. Yeah. So that's I haven't installed it, but looking at his screenshots, that's what it looks like. He said it took him a week trying to clean up the mess after somebody got his password file. FileZilla. Yeah, I feel like at this point, would it be better spent just making like a plugin for KeyPass or other yeah. key, you know, type database? I don't think it's even a good idea because the it's a it's a local issue. Like you're locally, if you have a local infection, it, there's more than that is the problem. And uh, they do actually do base sixty four encoding, so it's not like you can just read a plain text password. Uh, but it yeah. it's not encrypted. But that's kind of the purpose. They they want you to know that it's not totally encrypted because. Um, that's security theater at that point. Hmm. I think it's still a good idea to do it. I I, I feel like you should have security at all layers, like an onion. A beautiful well, the only thing that bothers onion. me about this particular one is that the commits are associated to, like, example.com email. <laughs> that's a little weird. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So he also he says the um, increase the maximum number of uh, transfer speeds from 10 to 
1,000. He says 1,000 is not really recommended, but 20, 20, 50, and even 100 threads has shown to work and increase transfer speeds by 5x. Hmm. Well, it's interesting to see uh, new development anyway. Yeah, and I guess it's something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't actually think about it. I didn't really think about the fact that uh, I might the files I might have really important server logins just sitting on my hard drive unencrypted. Because I otherwise I don't put I don't put passwords and text files on my hard drive right. even even if they're base sixty four encoded. I'm not comfortable with so that. The other thing that people should just just stop using I, FTP. Use SFTP. <laughs> like just you know like use keys. Use SFTP. Yeah. Is that what you were gonna say? <laughs> I, I would say FTP. But I also wanted to point out that. Even though uh, FileZilla is kind of ugly by default, there's a new th uh, theme icon pack called FlatZilla that actually makes it look pretty good. Ooh, okay, good to know. Nice tip. And telling people to stop using FTP is like, I don't you know. You should know, but some people don't. You can use FTP, just do it over SSH. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Come on, I. You know what it is? Like all those hosts out there that like host cheap websites and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to go with a great host like DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our special promo code of power, DO Unplugged, one word lowercase. And don't host it on some fly by night site that requires you to FTP up your files like an animal. Host it over at digitalocean.com. In fact, DigitalOcean has outrageously great pricing $5 a month. We'll give you a great rig with an SSD hard drive. It'll easily run a personal website like nobody's business. And with a $10 credit, you can run it two months for free. But look at this. Look at this pricing. If you're watching the video version right now, I want you to lick your screen. I want you to stand up and lick your screen. Three cents an hour for two gigabytes of memory, a two-core processor, a 40-gigabyte SSD, and three terabytes of boss-level transfer. Why is it boss-level? Well, that's a great question because you're reading from them SSDs over a 40 to a 40-gigabit E connection. And they got data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Toronto, and Germany. You could spin up a, you could spin up a droplet in each one of those. Now you're boss-level. Now you're bought. You see, you just you just went boss level. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code D O Unplugged. I'll tell you what else is boss level. Their interface. Holy shamoly, that interface. It is so well designed, so well laid out, but yet doesn't feel watered down. And then they have an API that's intuitive and command line utilities that allow you to run large scale production workloads. Or just something, you know, in your Quake terminal, drop it down and issue a command. You want to do a snapshot before you do a big transaction, a big upgrade, a big change? And you do. And you do. You also have great apps you can use on your phone. They have highly highly available, hi highly available storage. I said highly available storage. It's highly available. And you can run up to 16 terabytes. Attach it to your droplet. Here's what I would do. I'd start out with that three cents an hour rig. And then I'd put MB on there. And then I'd get a whole bunch of block storage and format it all ButterFS, all ButterFS all the time in RAID 5 mode. No, I'm just kidding. That's just, I'm just poking what are fun. You telling I'm these just people? poking fun. No, they got ZFS. So I would use that. You know, why not? Go use a real file system. And they got FreeBSD if you want to go that route. They got Ubuntu. They got Core you know, OS. MB is right in FreeBSD's package manager. Really? Yep. I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, and I, I would not, install MB. I would, BSD would not be my first choice for a uh, an MB server, but you could do it. You could do it for some reason. You could do it. You could also run Fedora up there on DigitalOcean. You could run good old classic Debian, nice lean and mean Core Debian. OS. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you need a, you know. Yeah. You could do it. You could do it. Why not? And you should. Hey, Wes, do it. Do Just it right do now. it. Just do it. Just go to digital, <laughs> digitalocean.com and use our promo code DO Unplugged. You apply it to your account and you get a $10 credit and you support the show. Big thanks, DigitalOcean, for sponsoring the Unplugged program. All right, we got to help our friend out. We, we had an uh, audience member write into the Jupiter Broadcasting subreddit. Yeah, there is one. <laughs> Who knew? And he says, please explain NFS to me before I destroy something. And I think he probably had an effing in there, but he probably <laughs> cut it out. And this is from Bugabinga, and he says, Are you planning or have you already made any guides or segments to setting up NFS at home? I realize NFS spans a wide range of use cases, but I'm interested from the perspective of a desktop Linux user, how to share media and documents with my family on our LAN. Here's my environment, which I'm curious if it's common amongst the Jupyter Broadcasting audience. I have a small family household with three to six persons, several desktops, laptops, and phones running Android and Linux. All wireless LAN, all 5 gigahertz. He says, there are some problems I ran into in setting up NFS. Old documentation we, with things confuse NFS 3 and 4. Uh, if, he's not even sure if NFS is supposed to work well over Wi-Fi. Endless combination of mount options, confusing security model, local UIDs and GUIDs versus remote UIDs and GUIDs UID, made by Moore's by old documentation. Hanging mounts on boot or logout. 
cannot use Ethernet cables because we don't have uh, we don't we can't use Ethernet because we don't own the flat we are living in. So they're doing Wi-Fi everywhere. He says I'm so fed up with NFS that I set up a somber share just for fun, and unfortunately, it works. Like that's an unfortunate thing. So I thought maybe we would uh, discuss that, but. Uh, First of all, we should just say up front, if Samba works for you, there's no shame in using Samba. Not at all. It, it's, it's Samba, had, they've spent significant time making Samba work great from Linux to Linux. Yeah, right. It really, it's first it really class. does. It's, it's, these days, like, there's, there's, there's graphical utilities to set up. It sounds like he's already got it working. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so, Wes, do you have any immediate thoughts about using NFS on a wireless LAN? I mean, I guess you will just have to make sure, like, I mean, it depends on the distributions that you're using, you know, but you need your storage daemons. Basically, you need like the dependency on the mounts with the storage daemons and on the network so that when if the network goes down, it'll, you know, you can have those connections or that you won't take the network down before unmounting your NFS share. How you do that probably depends. And wireless is obviously, you know, because now you need like a wireless daemon, you need like WPA sup- supplicant, that kind of thing. It's less ideal than like a simple DHCP. I, if Samba's working, I really would probably just stick with Samba. Mm-hmm. Me I mean, too. unless you have like a Maybe NFS, for some reason, is better in your environment, or you prefer working with it, or you have more experience. But if if not, I mean, Samba gets you a lot of things. If anybody in the mumble room has any suggestions, feel free to tag me with mum in the in the chat room. I want to cover just a couple of things to help him out here a little bit. Uh, quit worrying about NFS 3 versus NFS 4, really. Don't worry about that. You don't need to... If you don't have, like, performance issues or domain-type things or, you mm-hmm. know... Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna try to find uh, NFS Arch. I'm gonna put a link to the Arch Wiki's NFS entry in here because it also. I have it right here. Oh, good man! Would you drop that in the doc, uh, right by his question there? Because uh, this is where he's getting hung up on a lot. Is he says confusing mount options, uh, endless combinations of mount options. Well, here's here's the reality. Uh, you can you can actually leverage System D to make this better for you. System D can mount and unmount automatically your NFS share. Or, or mount point when it detects your network goes down and up. So respectively, when the network goes down, it will it'll unmount it, and when the network goes up, it'll remount it. And this is really nice. This is so you're using System D to manage the mount point, uh, which is aware of your network state. And that's so that's a really that's a really great feature. Uh, so consider looking into that, and that'll be in the Arch Wiki on how you set that up. It's really simple. Some of those mount options can also help your NFS right. share uh, and mount uh, um, tolerate. Fluctuations in network connectivity. I like to think of NFS as as close to like a physical con- connection to storage as possible over a network connection before we had iSCSI and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's it is designed in an era where the network is persistent right. and it expects it to be there, and the system that connects to it expects it to be part of the file system. So this is the problem you're running into. Is Samba is more forgiving with connections and disconnections because it was designed in an era where that's more frequent. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing, when you said you're having, you're, you're confused about the security model, where there's local UIDs and group IDs, and there's remote user IDs and group IDs. This is something that is much simpler if you have a little bit of forethought before you set up your local box in your NFS server. I always try to make sure that the user account I log into my Linux desktop has the same UID as the user account I'm connecting to or with on my NFS server. You same for you? Yeah, and I think this is where you see like NFS pairs well with things where you already have like some sort of LDAP or you have some sort of, you know, directory management system set up so that you do have the same users across multiple boxes. Yeah, otherwise what I try to do is I try to make sure that my local user is user 1000 and my remote user is user 1000. And that's generally if I'm the first person to create an account on my Linux desktop, mm-hmm. that's generally I'll be user 1000. And so you just have to take special note and and make sure that the user account and credentials you're connecting with are the same. Now you can specify the UID and GID that you want to connect with in your mount options. So you can do some right. of that there. Uh, but it is just simpler if everything lines up because then the security permissions just work. Yep. And when that when you do it that way, I find it to be the security model to be simpler than Samba, personally. So that is, all right, did we get anybody tagging me with suggestions from the, uh, I thought this might be up the Mumble Rooms Alley file sharing. What do you guys use in your uh, on your home networks to share files around the land? You know, big files. Only pr- maybe you're pr- primarily on Wi-Fi. You're not hooked up. What are you using to share files between Linux boxes? All about hmm. that Samba. Yeah, really. You just do you have mostly a... because I do have some Windows boxes and other yeah, things okay, that sure. I want to share right. with, and like other little like embedded appliances for TVs and stuff that only talk Samba. 
Yeah. So it makes sense just to do everything over Samba. So are you setting up a Samba server on each machine, or how are you doing that? Oh, no, 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 no. I just have a centralized uh, NAS, effectively, with Samba on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Same here. So, Popey, you, like, will from one laptop copy to a central share and then go to the other machine and copy it from that central so share? So I've got a HP micro server, which I used to have 12 disks in a ButterFS array, but I switched to ZFS recently, or ZFS, if you like to call it that. <laughs> um, and I also have, as another backup, a Netgear NAS, ready NAS thing that I recently learned has ButterFS in it. <laughs> and... Uh, that they're both Samba and I can just browse the network on anything, whether it's my Android phone or Ubuntu phone or laptops or desktops or Windows or whatever. I know Samba is going to work everywhere and I don't have to make any effort whatsoever for to connect to it. It just works. Hmm. Yeah, I'll give. OK, so let's go digital ice and then we'll go WW. So digital ice, you're using SSH. Yeah, I use SSHFS. Um you know, it's just simple. It's installed on your operating system ready, and uh, it's ready to go. Yeah, that's not mm-hmm. a bad way to go, really. It's just using SCP or SSHFS or something like that, because I like having SSH on all my machines anyways, the server right. and the client, obviously. All right, so WW, you have a cabling idea. Lay it on me. Yeah, so um, I live in an older house, and um, I can't really use a power line adapter, but I would suggest if he doesn't, maybe use that. Or what we do is we actually run the cable and then we use um, cable crimps, which you can lightly tap into the walls. So he could tape it maybe on the bottom or run along the wall on the bottom with tape. Or check with your landlord and see if you can lightly tap in those cable crimpers. And they're really easy to patch up. Um, when you move out, you know, you can hmm. just spackle. The just power spackle line networking in. could be interesting. I would want to test it first because right. I've had mixed results with it. Uh, like here at the studio, mm-hmm. I can't I can't plug something in upstairs and then plug the other end in by the TV right. and get networking from that. It's because it's like it's cross-circuit breakers or something. All right, so I was hoping Wimpy would represent someone using NFS because now I'm starting to feel like I'm a maniac using NFS to share files. So, Wimpy, what's your setup? Um, I use NFS exports effectively for me. So the most of the stuff that's accessed from the NASes in the house is over some protocol specific to what it does. So there's DLNA used for the music and Plex used for the photos and the videos. And that's what the devices in the, you know, the front room and all the rest of it uh, hooked up to. For me to actually hurl photos and videos and music into the servers, I use NFS. Um, And then I have a couple of Samba shares, which are just there. So when family and friends visit and they've got photos and things they want to share with us, they can just, you know, connect them from whatever computer that they're using and drop them in there. And then I can, you know, deal with them after the Are you doing like a guest Samba account too for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, well, it's just four guests. They've got their own wireless network as well, and their own VLAN. <laughs> that's a that's a oh oh really? That's so important. like a dedicated router in a in its own VLAN? No, no, uh, it's uh, same router. So it's just a VLAN on the same router. Nice. Um, and their own subnet, and they can't peer at any of the you know the management interfaces or anything like that. Huh. And the hosts on that VLAN can't contact one another either. All they can do is get to the internet Talk to and the get gateway to that Samba share. I yeah. just set up a, mm-hmm. a guest Wi-Fi network in Lady Jupiter because I figure, you know, we, we're going to hang out. I gotta, I'm got i meeting a couple of people on the way down, and once we get there, people are going to be welcomed into right. the Lady Jupiter. And the thing so. you know about uh, JB fans is they're they technically always, savvy. First question is, how do I get on the Wi-Fi? And the, the thing is, like... Well, now I got a data server, a file server on here, mm-hmm. and uh, my password is honestly embarrassing, and so I don't really want to tell like audience members that I just meet on the road. And it changes your threat model, right? Like it's like, well, it's Hadia and you and the kids, and you know, like a couple other trusted people. Then you can yeah. kind of be a little more liberal. Mm-hmm. Second, there's people you don't know or people you hardly know. Mm-hmm. That's different. And the router supports it, so it's just a matter of enabling that functionality. And so I just took a little time. I was like, I'm gonna have some people visiting, mm-hmm. so. It's like some people like they clean up and do like dishes and stuff before they have people over. I set up the guest Wi-Fi network. Second lap, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should probably install something, you know, like ad blocking. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right. Any other thoughts from the mumble room on file sharing over your homeland before we uh, move on? And hopefully, uh, Bugabinga is. Oh yeah, did you have some? 
Oh, I was just going to say, um, like when we said DLNA is something that can get, get used if you're, you know, serving certain types of things. I've also seen like WebDAV used or WebDAV or even if you're, if you're going one direction only, you can always just run an HTTP server. This is something the NextCloud does make kind of easy if you have yeah. a NextCloud server on your LAN is you can do the WebDAV thing or you could just be like, here's a URL to go to. This is something I do uh, for Angela with her Open Media Vault server. There's a couple of things mm-hmm. I installed on there. And I'm not setting up port forwarding on her router or anything like that. It's just, I just, here's the, here, go to this URL. It's all a local URL, but she can give it to her. She can give it to anybody that comes over. Nice. And so when they're taking pictures and stuff, they can put it on there. So that'll be, that'll be a nice thing. And it's like, why not just set that up and make it easy enough, yeah. give them a spot to go to, and then lock down the stuff that you're really concerned exactly. about. Exactly. That's, that's a good way to go. Uh, mm-hmm, go ahead. Well, Chris, this is going to be interesting. I'm actually thinking about setting up uh, Ubuntu or some kind of server with uh, file sharing after the show. Oh, yeah? What are you going to use? Um, Probably Z or NFS, something like that. But what are you going to use to share the files? Probably Samba now. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've had um, yeah, that's probably what I'm, yeah, that's probably what I'm looking at, yeah. Yeah, I think I would. I would. I think a lot of Linux users. Uh, some of us, when we move over to Linux, we want to reject anything Microsoft, and exactly. Samba feels like a Microsoft thing. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah. I, I would look at Samba as Samba actually represents a really kind of inspirational, like decade long journey to not only uh, figure out what Microsoft is doing in a way that doesn't viol- uh, violate patents and, and copyright and reverse engineer, but then to build a superior product. And then on top of that, they've built in functionality to make it so when the Samba client, when you connect to a Samba server and the Samba server realize that they're talking to each other, they've built in hooks to then communicate more efficiently and quicker and faster. Right. And they, they are aware of like the way the kernel works on each end of the system. And it is... It is like a superior technology, and that I think the Samba project probably doesn't get enough credit for. Okay, uh, MonkeyCom, you'll you'll wrap us up with a little uh, little uh, Kaja slash SFTP right in the file manager uh, t- approach. Tell me about it. Yeah, I've been using that for a while. It just it avoids having to set up something separate, something like Samba or NFS. You just set up SSH with user privileges, and you use your file browser in MTA. Yeah, and you can even just uh, bookmark it on the sidebar there, mm-hmm. which is, you, and you click it and it prompts you for the password if it's not saved in the key ring. And, you know, I guess that's how I get a lot of the systems here on the JB network these days. The reason why I don't like it a lot, and this is only if you're using it a lot, if you're using it heavily, is there is. There is the overhead of using GVFS, and then there is also the overhead of using SSH to encrypt everything. And so, uh, so I'm sitting here sending a three and a half to thirty gigabyte H.264 file, and I'm encrypting all of it. So my that's all hitting my CPU, and then it's all hitting the other side of the CPU to decode it, just so that way I can move from machine to machine. And I don't give two craps if it's encrypted or not. So here's the question: Is there something like SSH FS? But uh... Netcat FS? Because <laughs> that's I'll do that on a local network. You know, you're just piping it through Netcat and yes. go boom. Yes, there you go. That's what. That's what do you think of that? I mean, Hold that's on. basically tar. You know, what? you should Netcat. save that for the five. Uh, for the five. Uh, oh yeah. The, we're gonna we're gonna decide the five top uh, command line mm-hmm. uh, entries that that end users must know. New end users should learn, and we're just gonna accept that you, every now and then it's okay to learn the command line. And you know what? Speaking of learning the command line, it's a great time to mention Linux Academy third sponsor here on the unplug program which means we are winding down to the last segment pum, pum. i am uh, i am really impressed with linux academy they just closed another round of funding and they are really kicking into high gear i'll tell you about just some of the new things coming around the corner but first let me give you the basics go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged it's a platform to learn about linux and all of the really great things around the nitty-gritty aspects of linux and the stuff built on top of it uh, linuxacademy.com slash unplugged go there Sign up for a seven-day free trial, and then I have a course I want to recommend to you because it's such a no-brainer, and I'm not sure I've ever mentioned it before. They have a course on how to use Linux Academy. So you get the best out of Linux Academy by taking this introduction to Linux Academy wow, course. Wow, that's like man-man. Is, isn't, <laughs> isn't this a great idea, though? It seems like it. I mean, that seems... No, that seems essential. A good way to get like the most out of it. Uh, but here's a couple of new things they've been working on. You ready for you ready for this? Yeah. I'm not even sure if they've released this fully publicly yet, but this is this is new stuff that's just come that's out. That's why you listen here. We spill yeah. the beans. They've got the AWS certified DevOps engineer professional level course now. The Sys Admin, Admin, Sys Admin's guide to Bash scripting, the Cloud Essential certification prep course, running container and clusters with Kubernetes, which is very timeless right now or timeful right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Apache Spark Essentials, 
Hmm. Red Hat Certified Engineer Prep Course, the AWS Certified Sys Ops Administrator Course Refresh. They just refresh the courseware on that, and they just refresh the courseware on the Docker Deep Dive. Nice. Yeah, that is a good. That's also because there's been some updates there. Some big content updates coming soon for the AWS Concepts and uh, KVM Virtualization Essentials as well. That'll be coming in the fall, which is just about now. Lots of good stuff on Ansible coming down the pipe as well, which I know is uh, interesting to a lot of our audience member, as well as Big Data Essentials, Jenkins, Git Essentials and uh, Azure prep courses. So there's new releases just about every day right now at Linux Academy. So your subscription has never been more valuable. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go there, sign up for the seven-day free trial, support the show by visiting that URL, and learn more about the first platform built exclusively to teach you about Linux. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged program. So now... Speaking of command line tools that we need to learn, right. PC World has an article up that I think we should vet. The five terminal commands every Linux newbie should know. Dun, dun, dun. And I want to go through the list. I'm going to read them off to you. And okay. then I say we put any of these up for replacement. So we're testing you, making sure you know what they all are. So number one, every Linux newbie should know sudo. All right. Number two, and then we'll talk about these. You should know your package manager, be it yum, apt, pacman, of course. You should know your package manager. Number three, system CTL to manage systemd services. Okay, okay. Number four. I'm surprised it took number. I'm, I, I, see, I wonder if our list, if this wouldn't be yeah, maybe man. a little bit up on the list. LS, you know, to list directory. It seems like you might want that before number four. Mm-hmm. So I, this is, mm, and number five, man. Of course, we all know the man page, man pages. So they have, again, to recap, five is man, four is LS, three is system CTL, two is Pac-Man or apt, and one is sudo. I feel like, I feel like maybe nothing's missing here necessarily, although PS would be nice mm-hmm. or top would be nice. Yep. Um, I also, uh, we'll get into this, but I, I feel like if my, my list would be LS first, um, and probably man second. Yeah, man's pretty good. And then, uh, then I think I would do things like sudo. I think that'd be three. Mm-hmm. And I think, although should we not? Maybe we shouldn't tell them about sudo if they're reading this list. Okay, system CTL stays at three. Yeah. And sudo, I still feel like sudo should be I mean, you, should will, be you will need to learn it, right? Once you need to make any system change. I obviously. think sudo is four and your package manager is five. I think like the last thing you need to know as a new Linux user is how to use your package manager on the command line. You should learn how to list directories. I think you should look at, learn how to look at processes. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe know how to, how to do basic things like read a manual, reboot. Because Maybe free in there. If you don't know these yeah. tools, you're likely installing a distro that has a graphical package manager. Right. So you don't... Hey, that, right, none, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious to know what... Uh, let's see what some of the... Uh, let's see what some of the uh, Mumble Room thinks. So if, so if you guys have a list or a command that you think is missing, yeah, ping oh, me yeah. in the Mumble Room. Oh, you do, Poppy? Go ahead. So uh, I just pasted you a, a command you can run, which shows the <laughs> most popular 10 commands in your bash history. That's oh, awesome. that's a great one. And, and for me, the top five, number one is LS by a factor of two above <laughs> sure. the next thing that I've ever run, which is like CD. <laughs> right. So LS and CD and then sudo, which is not unreasonable on Ubuntu where you don't get a root account by default. Yeah. And then the next one is my editor of choice, which I'm not going to name because I'll just get hate. Ah. Um, and then there's other stuff after that. But yeah, LS and CD and sudo, they seem like reasonable things to have at the top of your list. So I, th- you- I think you should say, and we, we can debunk a myth here. <laughs> Well, I'll go I first. should tell you. My, 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 my favorite editor is Nano. <gasps> on the yeah, same. Oh, yeah. Were, were you guys? Were you, you guys? Dang. Were you here Nano. earlier in the show where I admitted to getting crap for the last two I, weeks because I used I, Nano? I heard you mention it, and <laughs> I wasn't here to back you up. But I've been using <laughs> Nano forever, and this is this is mostly because the first Unix system I used. Uh, Pine was the email yes, client, yes. and consequently um, Pico was the oh editor. My okay, God, Pico, so yes. hard, hard co- and Nano is a Pico clone. <gasps> so hard coded into my DNA 
is all the key bindings for Nano. And I knew that. I knew there these... was a reason I liked you, Martin. <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> and I all these people that say that you know Vim and Vi it's so powerful, and you, there's all these key bindings. Well, there's all these key bindings in Nano as well. Um, and if you know them, it's just as just as fast and productive. I love you. That is amazing. I forgot about Pico and that absolutely in Pine. Yes. <laughs> Yes. All right. So is it nano for you too, Popey, that I take it? I, uh, I, yep. All right. Wow. Now, JDA, I think I saw that go by. Uh, you also use nano. Yes, I also use nano. And I'll say as a visually impaired Linux user, um, yeah, I'm low. So it just it's, it's a lot more hmm. user friendly when you're zoomed in to a pretty high degree on a monitor than the alternatives out there. And just as someone who's tried all the different ones, in an accessibility standpoint, Nano takes the cake, and I just wanted to throw wow. my two cents in there. I can't believe we started the show out with me admitting to all the crap I was getting. And uh, uh, Ben, you use Nano as well? Yeah, man. Look at you. And nobody I, uh, stood up. Nobody yes, said anything. Club Nano. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Damn. The wrong has you see been guys, righted. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> you see, guys, I am visually impaired too. I have to wear glasses because I have astigmatism and light problem. And truthfully, I just got to use Nano because of my sight <laughs> and because. You know, I also have autism, so it's kind of hard for me to wrap my hand around other areas. Dude, so yeah, dude, you yeah. don't have to justify it; just embrace it. That's right. Nano yeah. user. I love the nano. It's fine. Yeah. Sweet Lou, you're I mean, a nano user too, Sweet Lou. Oh yeah. And Jeez. my uh, hierarchy is sudo cd tar ls and wp. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, you guys. You want to know mine? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. My my top ran command. Do you have a guess before I say what it is? Don't look. Do you OBS. have a guess? Ping. Jitsi. <laughs> huh? Ping. Ping. Sky. Jitsi or OBS? Nope. It is Packer dash dash SYU. Nice. Dang. <laughs> wow. Archbox. Mm. Right? Someone has a problem. Typical arch user. <laughs> I'm updating oh, yeah. my packages. I'm updating my packages. <laughs> yeah, Spin got it. Spin got it. Oh, uh, ngrep for MonkeyCom. Huh? What are you using ngrep for so much, MonkeyCom? I run a telecom, so I'm constantly looking at streams. That makes sense. <laughs> Hence the name. My I top ten it. has a YouTube DL on it. Really? Mm -hmm. I bet mine upstairs does where I do the unfiltered clips because yep. I pull a lot now these days off YouTube. So uh, my top is C. My top command is CD, and then sudo ls git nano rm ssh cat apt and yadim. Hmm. hmm. I think you can tell mine is a laptop because like ssh. Ping, MTR, IP. I'm, yeah. Clearly, I'm on a lot of networks. And you're testing your connectivity uh -huh. each time. Like, why is this not going as fast as this should? What's the, what's the problem with this thing? Why is YouTube <laughs> DL so slow? Oh, man. YouTube DL is one of the best, the best applications ever. Do you know, it's funny. I, I see like lots of these scrolling by in IRC people saying LS is their most popular thing. And when you watch people doing screencasts with this command line stuff, when people are... If they don't plan their video well, you'll often see them just type ls randomly. I've watched mm -hmm. people give presentations where they're they're about to type it, a command. It's like your idle instead thing. of yeah, yeah, it's like uh, it's like the terminal, you know how um, like Valley people say so in front yeah. of a sentence. Yeah, like it, nerds say ls yes. in front of a sentence. So true, before though. They do stuff. It's like a nervous tick anymore sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's my, like that's my um and pause yeah. for thought. Yeah, nice thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I don't. You'd think I would use like PWD more to get my my current direction. Directory, but no, yeah. it's LS, and I always recognize where I'm at by what I see on the screen. And I get, I'm getting my, you know, I'm getting like, a, and I even do LS dash LA. I don't, I like to have it. I oh, like it's to, always dash LA, man. Yeah. Always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like to have it with the attributes and the timestamp. Oh, right? no. Uh, I, we I are do such nerds. We LS really minus are. Lisa. <laughs> oh, Lisa. Yeah. Now, what is the, uh, what is the S? So I, I want to try it now. Now I'm, now I'm going to go do that. You could have told me something. That yeah, was... SL is probably 10% of my commands, too. Oh my one. god, that's too wide. Oh, that's too wide, yeah. Gives you, it gives you everything, man. Yeah, it does. I'll, 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 I used to be a sysadmin. Too much info. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'll do a little... You need that stuff. See, oh, well, actually, LS still does quite a bit of stuff, too. Look at all that, though. See, Rikai says LS minus LART, and I like that because it's easy to remember, but I always type it L-A... L-A... No, L-T-R-A for some reason. I can't type it in the right order. We are really geeking out now. That's this yeah, is uh, this is this is this is the best Linux podcast. This is the Linux podcast at its finest right here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so LS I, is obviously on the top of all of our lists for these five new for these five commands for new users. What else? is there anything else missing? I would say that if you have system CTL, you should really mention journal CTL. Mm, yes, because that's an under. I mean, people 
Don't Ma- Michael how Dominic, easy it is to make it review things. Michael Dominic's system kernel pa- panicked on him, and he was not sure how he was supposed to look at the logs anymore. It mm-hmm. was mm. totally foreign to him. So yeah, that would be uh, that would be a good one. Yeah, Monkey Comp saying tail dash f log. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or journal CTL. Yeah. All right, that's a good one. Any others? I think we. So I, mean, I think you want maybe maybe you'll want like IP or if config, but really oh, IP and, just for. What do you think, Wes? Yeah, I or yeah. What do you think, Wes, of? Uh, of just admitting that it's not horrible to know a couple of command line tools. Like, the computer is a tool. Right. And do we have to pretend like there's no command line all the mm-hmm. time? And it seems like, a, you know, like really the equilibrium we should reach is you use GUIs for things that you enjoy using GUIs for, and it makes sense to use them for, and you use the command line when it, you know, makes sense to do that. And yeah. obviously it'll be different per user, but it shouldn't be something that has to be hidden away. One of the things I've seen happen a couple of times um, – either directly or indirectly, just either by being involved with a migration or just watching a migration as a third party is, I have watched several times uh, companies transition from DOS-based, like terminal input, like mm-hmm. either through like a, yes. an SSH login or a VTR or a v- whatever, like the old virtual terminals for mainframes mm-hmm. or or just a DOS app, like they could fly through with the keyboard. You could, you know, like they... Yep, right. And then, okay, and then, okay, Mr. Fisher... Okay, yep, we're ready to go. And I just dumped all that in the good side <laughs> chat room. <laughs> um, and uh, now they're like, okay, let me, uh, let's see. I don't really know how to use the system. I see, I, I, um, so you wanted to move your reservation to, uh, okay, well, yeah, okay. So if I go into here and I click, like, it's their efficiency really dropped off. And I'm not trying to say that the command line was easier to use, mm-hmm. but there is something about, that particular interface, it is sometimes the most efficient way to interact with the computer. Right, it's that balance of like utility versus learning curve, and you know, so something that may make sense for a home user, a casual user, might not make sense for someone that whose job it is to use software every day. Uh, William, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to suggest. Even my parents are kind of like that. Like they kind of remember the good old DOS days <laughs> when I bring them back to a terminal. It's nice. kind of hilarious, and it's kind of nostalgic and fun. The yeah. few times they have to use it. I was all like the first cu- first time, first time I was migrating a company from a DOS system where it was a, it was a DOS system that loaded up and then it launched a DOS based mainframe terminal. I'm trying, I can't even remember what those terminals are called anymore. Um, and uh, then they they spent their entire day in this system, and that was the computer to them. And I migrated them to a to a graphical version of wow. that, mm-hmm. and it 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 sucked so bad. It was I had I was so gung ho about moving this company into the modern day and getting them on a graphical interface, and it was going to be you know replacing all these everything. old custom built PCs with brand new thin clients, and and it just was a huge usability reduction, and it was never part of the conversation. Well, it might have been an eight it had eighty two seventy. It might have been. It doesn't that doesn't ring the I bell? I think people though. who don't actually use the system take for granted how much muscle memory there is in typing that stuff out, and how quick you can translate what you want in your head mm-hmm. to some pattern mm-hmm. you type in on the console after you've done it so many times. Yeah, and if it's like if it's a series of eight menu options, and it's one through yeah. eight to trigger them, and your hands already hovering to the keyboard, you just tap that yeah. thing out super quick. Like especially the hotel receptionists and stuff who have got it down to a science, and they're just like banging on the keyboard and just yeah. get it all done immediately. Yeah. Yep. 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 That uh, that is there. So there, I think I think when we talk about Linux, and we're I think a lot of people that are going to be moving over to Linux are geek power users. I don't know. Right. If, I mean, I'm sure it's not all of them, but we've been talking about this theoretical frustrated web development user mm-hmm. who's got a MacBook a few years ago because it was BSD with a GUI, and now they've realized, oh, this is actually a commercial product that has a lot of other interests, and it's not their primary focus, it's not their main platform, it's not their money maker, mm-hmm. and there's a huge strategy tax that's dragging this entire platform around by the ball sack. I want to move to something where I can just get my work done, I can get a laptop with the hardware I want, and I can still SSH into the same servers and right. build my same applications. That's... And there's a lot of little niche use cases like that, like uh, like user error. User error two years ago, I never could have produced the entire yep. thing using Linux and open source software. And now, like, we have an entire system that's all yeah. open. I mean, it's like a lot of different use cases are switching over to Linux, and, and each little niche vertical is going to add up to a serious it amount of the users. momentum. I, I yeah. hope, I think. That's, that's, the, that's the theory, right? That's the hope. That's the theory. Right. And so when they come here, why not say, yeah, you'll have to use the command line sometimes. There's probably like six, five, six, seven, eight commands you should probably do. You, you should probably learn, take a half hour and yep. learn each one 
and you will have a good set of tools to learn more from there. If you know MAN, you yeah. know LS, you know how to look at processes, you know how to stop and start services, you know a lot of stuff that you're and, ever going to have to do at the command line. And maybe that's a good, uh, good way to approach it, right? Like it's different than like if you're going to the Windows world where um, – you know, like there's a whole huge system of things to learn uh, on Linux. There's a lot of you can get by with a lot of like just a few fundamental principles, you know, five or ten commands that you need to know, and then you can administer a fair bit of your system. Hurricane, you think Windows 10 users are ripe for the picking too? Yeah, well, I started on Windows 10 or as a Windows user a couple years ago, and then two years ago when Windows 10s came out, I just completely dropped it. Yeah, I, I can and see that's it. when I started. You know, I mean, packaging them before you guys and for you, I mean, the community. And now all my machines run Linux. Well, our, our one then, our benefit. <laughs> that's that's, that's awesome. That is really good. Uh, all right. So, um, Ben, I want to give you a chance to jump in because you are you you got the new System76 machine. You're switching over from the MacBook. You're not afraid of the command line. You're, you're okay with it. Ben, go. No? Go on once? Go on twice? All right, Swift, I'll let you have the last word on this particular one. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. In in this case, it's like with Vista. I remember when that came um, out. I was Ben, the guy who sold you the MacBook. That's all right. Hold on. Let, let Swift go. Go ahead, Swift. Okay. When Vista came out, you would have thought that that would have been a big deal to get people to Linux. And yet, even though it was such a catastrophe, that's not what happened. And no, they so went to the Mac. With, yeah. So with Windows 10, I mean, I wonder how that's going to be the change now with MacBook Pros being what they are now and just with people getting aggravated with Apple. I'm curious if that's ever going to happen and make people really switch to Linux. That's what I want to see. I think that is what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think it is. I think a lot of them, I think when Vista came out, people said to themselves, that's it, Uh, I'm going to get a Mac. Uh, I was going to get a Ubuntu rig, but they ruined it. They ruined it for us. The the, the Unity ruined everything. Uh. (laughs) That was actually surprisingly common. I feel like a lot of the blogs kind of talked about how they looked at you know, right when the Unity transition happened, they had been looking at uh, using Linux and then went to Mac OS. So it's interesting that it, that inflection point wasn't that long ago. I know, I know. I, I, do, I do think that is partially So it true. makes me give the idea like that part of this momentum is that like some of these Mac users have had their eye on Linux for yes. a while, right? Like they've considered it. Maybe yeah. it hasn't met their, the standards, but they don't think it can. Or what they did before isn't what they do now. Mm-hmm. Like Mike was all in on iOS development. Right. And then he's like, well, this isn't paying the bills. Right. He's doing more back-end stuff now. Yeah. Than... And now then he's like, well, wait a minute. If I'm just doing back-end work. What am I doing? Mm-hmm. And I think that's true for a lot of them as well. Uh, and uh, th- I think distros are better than they used to be. Yeah. And a lot of progress has been made on that kind of thing. And, you know, we've I think Linux has learned some of, like, what Mac did by having such an integrated stack and the kind of, like, seamlessness and the integration and the consistency. And we've gotten better there, too. Meanwhile, Wes, we'll just sit back. And say, we told you so. No, watch. We'll welcome them with open arms and tell them which five or six command line apps they should probably bother mm-hmm. learning. They probably already know half of them from the Mac anyways. So they probably only have to learn like another three or four more. Yep. They're probably already set. All right. Well, we're going to get out of here. We're, I don't know if this has ended up being a short show or not because uh, it kind of felt like, a, I guess it was so just good, a regular good. size show. Mm-hmm. But uh, we're going to get out of here because the elections are coming up. And then I am jumping on the road and heading down to California. Getting so out of town. Don't forget about that meetup at meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. And do come back next week and uh, hang out with uh, Noah Wes and the gang. Yeah, be here. Yeah, Noah will be in studio. So you guys, what a treat. You guys can hang out and, uh, you know. Cut rugs or whatever you got. What, I don't know what you guys. I don't know. You're, you should tune in. Chris. I'm never be here, here live. Yeah, maybe. I wonder what they'll be up to. Mm-hmm. Of course, if I tune in and I don't like it, then what do I do? Jump in the mumble room and yell at you guys? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, well, thanks we'll cut for you off. Don't worry. Yeah. Oh, that guy! Get him out of here! Kick Ooh. him out! Kick him out! <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here next Tuesday.
Oh, there we go. All right, jbtitles.com. jbtitles.com. Get over that. Out. So what distro are you still running there on that uh, laptop, Wes? Ooh, this would be Arch Linux. It is. It's not. A, is it a Pricity, though? That's what I was wondering. Nope, is it, just Arch. Oh, you reloaded to uh, go. Oh, really? Really? Mm, no more. What are you doing there on the yep, desk? No, really? Really? Mm-hmm. Really? But pretty minimal right now, like very few plugins. Have you had a chance to see the Linux Action Show from Sunday? Noah had some really mm-hmm. weird performance issues on his Archbox. Yeah, that did seem weird. I was excited that he switched, though. Yeah, a lot of people think he's crazy for doing it. The What's Reddit. the hardware he's running? I, I don't know exactly. Yeah, that performance stuff seemed weird. I saw that. It was watch a little it weird. Again. Yeah, it seemed really weird. Like, the launch times, was uh, like, even for a fresh install. Mm-hmm. And he's doing all SSDs, I think. Um, yeah, Chris, I actually saw that show, and I saw the lag he was getting. I was like, what the heck is this? Yeah, that was the weirdest thing. And I, if I to me, it, was, it looked like network, because it affects both Chrome mm-hmm. and Firefox. I don't know what kind of Wi-Fi he's got, man, but I got to tell you, it's uh, it looked pretty laggy. And I yeah. tell you, I'm on Time Warner with the 300 meg internet, and I was getting 350 today. Should we have like a nano title? Should we should probably have a Maybe, nano title, yeah. right? It was pretty. I like how until Popey and Wimpy said anything, uh, and it was it was really it was really Wimpy that pushed it. No, everybody else is like quiet about it. I'm all up here admitting my nano sin. And everybody's like. <laughs> I run Nano, but I'm not saying nothing. Yeah, we should have stuck so, up with you back there. <laughs> at, my, at my last yeah. job, not the job I have now, exactly. but my last job, when there, when we were doing stuff, occasionally you have to gather around someone's computer. When everyone used to gather around my computer and I would edit something, mm-hmm. I could actually hear them say, freak, as I uh, typed in Nano. Amazing. Yeah, this, Nano Shame's <laughs> been around forever. I mean, it started as a bit of a joke, actually. Uh, and I think it was Pico we were using back in the day that started as the joke, mm-hmm. not Nano. Well, I, so originally I was, well, I, I was using Pico on Unix systems and then on... So, on not, Linux, not I would load fir- Pico too, though. I wouldn't load Nano. Uh, yeah, in the early days, Pico. And then a little bit later on, it was, Nano was co- called Tip. This isn't Pico <laughs> originally. Yeah. And then it changed to Nano. Because Nano is a thousand times larger than I, Pico. I, I feel like it was like Gentoo or something that made me switch from Pico to Nano, but I don't remember. I feel like there yeah, was I a, remember going um, through that transition of you know learning um, Nano, not Tip, um, you know, not Pico. But yeah, yeah, but uh, it was it was all it was all just because the only email I had available to was Pine, and mm-hmm. I I just learned how to get around using Pico. So as soon as I started exploring the system. I edited everything with Pico, and that's just stuck with me for however many years it is. Nano users unite, and nano aggressions are not bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, nano users come out of the closets funny, but it's too long, I think. Right. And nano the lesser Emacs is kind of is kind of slammy. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I was thinking along the lines of nano FTW, but that was I don't know. Not so nano now. Hmm. I kind of like that one. I wonder how the drone thing worked out. See, now someone needs to implement nano. Like, like there's the evil mode for Emacs. Maybe there should be a nano mode for Emacs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I would like pirate mode. Or did you ever see? You have to be kind of old, but uh, did you ever did you ever install Red Hat when you could install it in? Oh, I forget what they call it, but it was basically it was redneck mode. It was when Red Hat was tes- testing out multilingual support, uh-huh. and so they were testing redneck mode, and they actually shipped a version, or it was a beta, where you could, I think it was like in the 5 series or something, where you could install Red Hat Linux in redneck mode. Actually existed. Ooh. It was amazing.